So this story is called Blood, Sweat, and Tears. That day, they arose before the sun was up. They had ridden their wagons away across the hills and plains to a reach of the old grin the boy had never seen before. The sun was kissing the horizon by then, and the beauty of early morning light was bathing the incredible trees in gold across white trunks and their deep blue leaves. Each of them was similar to the other, with not a single tree deviating from the family look. And at times, despite the light, the boy could swear there were shadows just outside the corner of his eyes. And in the midst of the grove, he sometimes felt he was being watched, though the wood itself was always silent, with nary a step beyond their own making any noise. Even the wind was seldom there. What is this place, uncle? young Clayne asked. Tis a sacred wood, nephew, uncle answered, never looking at the boys he kept watch on the path and hold on the mule's reins. These trees are older than any kingdom, though they are ever thin and short. Clayne felt himself growing nervous. Are we permitted to cross through here? Any may tread this path. It has neither toll nor gate. Either would be a sin on sacred ground. Of course, that made plenty of sense to the boy, even though his sister had often said he was short on wits. He tried to calm his head, but something in his heart was still nervous. The question appeared in half a whisper before he could think of what he was saying. But are we permitted to work here? That was when Uncle looked at his nephew. Nothing his eye, in his eye had changed, and right then Clay knew that this had been their destination from the beginning. Uncle had told him they were going to a great place to set up a new forge. That was why they had to bring so many bricks and the anvil and a barrel of water. Uncle meant to set up a brand new forge, and where that was there would be no bricks or anvils or barrels of water to already use. No fire is permitted in sacred woods, Uncle said, turning his eyes back to the road. Tis an affront. An affront to what? Uncle pointed to the treetops of the wagging finger. To the trees, to the gods, to the spirits that consider this their abode. Clayne did not fear trees, nor did he fear gods, but always he hated the idea of spirits though he had never been sure he had seen a one. His panic grew. Uncle, are we going to offend the spirits? Worry not, nephew. The spirits only awake at night, and if we work fast, they shall not have time to put on their ghastly boots before we finish our work and leave. Clayne looked around. He was big and strong. He had already learned to shave, and he could wrestle mean goats with his bare hands, and all this through, though he was not yet called a man. But no strength could save a man from spirits. No fist could beat them, no sword could cut them, no king could command them. Clayne hated spirits, hated them. Uncle, I will not spend a single night in here. Nor I, said Uncle, so we shall hurry our work before we need sleep, else the spirits will break the forge before the second sunrise. Clayne nodded, nervous but somewhat relieved, knowing there was something to do which avoided the spirits. I'll work twice as hard, he whispered to himself. The sun had r nearly risen in full beyond the ridge when at last Uncle reined the cart off the path. Its light, though present, was drowned by the thick dark leaves of the trees. Occasional glimmers of golden sunlight would peek out from the foliage, its perfect rays almost dancing with the sway of the trees as the day went on. It was no small relief to work in perfect shade, and Clayne made good on his promise to carry and stack bricks better than he ever had in his life. In spite of all the work, he even began to smile long before the job was done. Brick by brick, the smelter began to sh take shape, a crude and boxy thing which offered little dignity, but a smelter nonetheless. Before it was quite done, Uncle sent Clayne away. Nephew, go and bring some kindling for the fire. That was easier work than laying brick, though Clayne did not mind either way. But as he walked away from the beginning of their makeshift forge, he noticed something. In his lacking mind, Clayne thought carefully about what it was he was going he was seeking as he looked upon the road. His tired mind turned and turned and found no answer until at last the strange thing hit him like a ram. Without thinking of his words, he turned back and shouted to his uncle, Uncle, there are no branches on the ground. Uncle nearly jumped up from his work to shush the boy from many paces away. Keep your voice down, boy, he said in a loud whisper. This is not a work meant to be done here, remember? Clayne's face grew warm with blush. Sorry, he whispered back. Uncle pointed to the back of the cart where they had gotten the bricks. Grab yourself a hatchet and cut down some of the lower branches. Clayne obeyed with some reluctance. Many questions danced in his sweating mind. Why were there no branches on the ground? Had someone taken them away since they were sacred trees? Or were these trees sacred because they dropped no branch? For that matter, why did Uncle not bring his own branches? 
As he looked in the back of the car, he took note of how much room there was to spare. They could have fit a half dozen faggots in there and still had room left. And as he took the hatchet and climbed, off, climbed back off the car, he wondered if perhaps that was why they were here in the first place, to use these sacred branches. But what was good about them? What branches got used made no difference. Uncle had told him as such long ago, even before Clean was strong enough to lay bricks. And for that matter, wouldn't fresh-cut branches be too green to burn? Would these branches be green at all if their bark was white and their leaves were blue? Clayne, curious with this question, found that it was easy to hack off a low limb from the tree. Looking upon its bark, looking inside its bark, he saw that the inside of the tree was black as rot, yet it smelled lovely. He had never sm liked the smell of flowers, but he, but he had always liked the smell of burning wood, and the scent of these trees was not unlike that. He cut down many branches from d many different trees, all of them amazingly alike, from the inside and out. He brought back the biggest armful he could manage, and was just about to dust his hands when Uncle, who was still setting up the forge, told him they needed even more branches. Clayton almost protested to say that he had brought a lot, but caught himself just before, and pushed the complaint out of his mind to set on the work. Just to be safe, he brought back two more armfuls before stopping. Uncle barely seemed to notice. Clayton stood until his uncle finished the forge. The billows were already in place, Uncle pumping it to stoke the flame, and many of the branches had been ignited in the smelter, burning brightly with ease. Nephew, Uncle said without turning from the smelter, I'll need the anvil soon. Lift it over here while I continue to stoke the fire. You're not going to help me? Even as Clayne asked, he felt to be a child speaking the words. But how could he lift an anvil on his own? Strong as he was, he had never seen any man do that. If I do, the work will take far longer. But I can help you. If you're not strong enough, Clayton twisted at the accusation. He did not want the work to take longer, but was he strong enough to lift an anvil? He walked to the car to find out. He was pleased to see that the anvil taken was not so big as most. He did not even stop to think that perhaps his uncle had lifted it up into the cart all on his own. The boy puffed up his chest, tightened his grip, and lifted with all his might. To his surprise, the anvil came up with him. He held his breath and his strength, and waddled with incredible the incredible weight of the iron all the way over to where his uncle stood. Feet apart, he set down the anvil and at last took a well-deserved breath. He smiled widely and proudly patted the thick muscle of his arm. But uncle did not even look at him as he spoke. Get me also the little box in the back, the one that rattles. It has the ore in it. Saddened but not defeated, Clayne did it as he was told. At least that was easy to lift. This is nearly ready, uncle said. Only now I need the water for the quenching. I'll go get it, uncle, Clayne said, turning away. To his surprise, uncle stopped him with a word. Actually, let me go get it. You stay here. That was strange. Uncle always had him do the heavy work, just like father and the others in the village. Clayne's tired mind worked and worked to understand, finding no good reason for this new command. Are you sure, uncle? Don't you want me to at least help you lift the water barrel? Don't be daft, boy. The barrel's too heavy, and we won't need the whole thing. This is no sword we're making. We only need a bit of shallow water. The pail will do. Uncle pointed back to the forge. Make sure the fire stays hot. That made much more sense. But strangely, Clayne did not feel quite so satisfied. He turned the matter over in his tired mind and could neither understand his own, his own feelings or his uncle's thoughts. Even if it was only the pail, which really looked more like a wide bucket than any other pail Clayne had seen, why not have him do it? After all, Uncle was already stoking the flame himself. Had he merely gotten tired from the heat and needed a small break? Clayne wasn't sure. For that matter, he had never seen his uncle take a small break, certainly not so early in the day. Regardless, Clayne obeyed, trying to put this, uh, this strange notion out of his mind. He continued to pump the bellow, an exercise which remind him just, reminded him just how strong he was. He felt another twinge of pride, but still his thoughts turned to his uncle, even as the man was pouring out their drink, their drinking water into the pail. It was indeed a shallow thing. Clayne had noticed it at their journey's beginning, but did not think much of it then. Even, even now, he did not think it was to be used for quenching. What was it uncle said? They were not making a sword? But then what were they making? Clayne realized uncle had never told him. Uncle, Clayne called out between mighty stokes of the bellow. What is it you intend to make today? Some realization dawned on him, even as he spoke aloud. 
It could not be very large if you're using such shallow water. Uncle still was not looking at him, even as he grabbed his tongs and his hammer and carried them inside the water of the old iron pail, which was near as wide as Uncle's shoulders. There was something else Uncle grabbed, but it was small and not something Clayton recognized. Uncle had not put it in the pail. Instead, he placed it on the backside of his belt with such a careful practice move, Clayton wondered if Uncle had not merely adjusted his trousers. But no, Uncle had indeed put something there. Clayton was sure of it. A mask, Uncle finally answered as he set down the pail, sloshing some of the water off to the side. That was even more strange. Uncle never had any fancy for masks or decorations. Though his thoughts, Clayton, through his thoughts, Clayton felt as though he were being watched by some massive, beach, massive beast just outside his vision. Though even his fear fluttered in his belly, he could not turn away from his uncle. Why are you making a mask? Clayton asked, trying and mostly failing to conceal his fear. His uncle, who was only leaning over the quench, would not look at him even as he spoke. Clayton could not help but wonder if uncle was avoiding his gaze. I keep having dreams. Before Clayton could inquire further, his uncle went on, in a wood precisely as this. I am there, forging a mask of iron. When it is finished, it is unpainted. Yet the outside is white and the inside of it is black. Despite how clear the dream was, I did not think much of it the first night. But it persists. Every night since I dream of it, or I do not sleep at all. Clayton scratched his head. Am I in your dream too, uncle? But uncle did not answer. He turned his sight back to the water pail and took out his tools, setting them aside. Clayton was near and ready to push for an answer when uncle began to swirl his hand into the water. Then at last, he looked at Clayton. Nephew, he said with a voice as clear as day, I have lost my ring in the pail, but I cannot seem to find it with my old eyes. Could you come over and look in it for me? Again, Clayton was, was set aback. The fear was rising in him without sense, but he was doing better at hiding it. Had Uncle been wearing a ring? His nephew did not notice. Are you sure it's in there? It's the only place it could be. Please, just come look. Clayton felt as though something invisible was pulling him back, but he paid it little heed. The steps he took to join his uncle were heavy and slow. The short distance between the two seemed to be a mile long. Perhaps you should let me carry the pail, then. That way you would not have lost your ring. Uncle nodded. Aye, perhaps I should have. He did not look at his nephew. Uncle did not move from his spot, and so Clayton had no choice but to stand opposite of him before the pail. He looked down with care. His eye He was sure his eyes were good, but... Uncle, there's no ring in here. Are you sure you lost it in the water? How did it even come off? Uncle sounded angry as he spoke. Yes, I'm sure! Look closer, boy. There's a dark ring. Its color matches the metal. Clayton shot a look at his uncle. He knew better than the question those older than him. So he bent a knee to take a better look, his arms at the pale sides, looking, or looking better down into the perfect, clear water. It was a swift and practiced move uncle did. He grabbed the boy by the hair with one hand, and with the other pulled the little knife out from the back of his belt. The knife was sharp as sharp could get, and he cut the boy... <clears throat> and cut the boy with ease, all the way from its front to the back where the uncle could feel it cut the neck bone. The boy jolted but could not scream. He managed only a gurgle of pain. His muscles tensed, but his uncle was far stronger, and shoved the hair of his head down into the water, where it began to cloud the boy's red blood. The child's ears were, dr were down past the water's line as he struggled in vain for life, but still uncle spoke to the boy as if he could hear. Sorry, nephew. The boy kicked and tossed, but only for a moment, and then he began to grow still as the life drained from him. At last, the struggle ceased, and the boy's strong arms went limp. Uncle kept both his grips for some time, despite having seen himself act in the dream. Despite knowing what he had to do, it was still a strange thing. He wondered if he would once again wake at any moment, but the warm blood of the knife soaked into his hand and reminded him of the reality. Eventually, he let go of the boy's hair. He would have liked to leave him undisturbed, but he knew he still had to quench the mask in forging, 
so he kicked the boy carefully away so as not to disturb the bloody concoction the two of them had made together. The boy's eyes were still open, looking up to the strange tree's crowns with dead, with dead awe. His uncle could not bear to look upon what was left of him, so he instead ignored him as he went about his work. The forge's fire seemed to grow cold far too quickly, so every other moment uncle found himself working the bellows until he could feel the heat again. The work itself was as short as a blink, and as long as a day, all at once. The iron melted well and fit the clay mold, which he had effortlessly carved before this gruesome journey began. It was not his design, of course, but it had only taken a single try to match the dream's design. When he first looked upon it, he knew he, <clears throat> he knew what was to come was unavoidable, so he set out as swift as possible to get it over with. As he hammered the mask with careful blows, he found himself thinking of Clayne, whom he had known since the lad was born. He had liked Clayne. He had always liked Clayne. The boy had been stupid from the first, but he had been a charming and hard-working boy, one that was not so much a lout as most others uncle had met. His eyes watered and fell upon the red-hot iron of the mask to be, but not even the blindness of tears could stop him from working. He continued to mallet the iron of the mask until something within him told him it was ready. The mask was far from smooth, but it had been a perfect replica of the dream right down to the exact same dents in its chevron face. With his tongs, he quenched the iron in the blood and water, trying his hardest not to look at what remained of the boy, but always seeing him in the corner of his eyes. The sizzle of the work hissed and burned with steam. When at last he raised it from the quench, he looked upon it and saw that the colors had come to pass all on their own. The outside was white. The, the inside was black. And though the design was simple, it was indeed one face on the outside and an entirely different face on the inside. His attention was drawn away from the mask only when he felt a heat at his neck. Despite his sweat, he had not noticed that all around the sacred wood was burning, the trees alight in a sea of fire, the flames at every trunk swallowing their all. He did not quite know how it went unnoticed, but he knew that he was the cause of it that somehow his billows had breathed the sparks of this great blaze. This had not happened in his dream, yet he knew it was all a part of what was meant to occur. The mule and his cart were long gone. The boy was dead. Uncle thought he might be so lucky that the flames would devour him with the forest so that he might be forgiven for doing such an awful work. But as he closed his eyes with awaiting death, a new and wordless thought occurred. He opened his sight to find a path amidst all the burning. It was then he realized his work was not yet done. The body of his nephew he left, and slowly it was devoured with the flames, the boy's dead eyes watching the trees and the sky until they were blinded by the ash. All right. 